Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first session of the Hutchins Center's Alum Fellows Reading Series. We are excited to have Patricia Sullivan and Randall Kennedy with us. Randall Kennedy is Michael R. Klein Professor at the Harvard Law School. His specializations include criminal law and the regulation of race relations. He is the author of numerous articles and books in these areas, including recently, Say It Loud on Race, History, and Culture. Please welcome Professor Kennedy as he converses with Patricia Sullivan. Thank you so much. Really appreciate this forum and I look forward very much to our upcoming discussion. Our guest is Patricia Sullivan, distinguished professor at the University of South Carolina History Department. Patricia Sullivan has written many articles, uh, several leading books, just to name a couple, mm -hmm. Days of Hope, Race and Democracy in the New Deal Era. Then there was Lift Every Voice, the NAACP and the Making of the Civil Rights Movement. The book that we're going to be focusing on today is her most recent book, this very formidable um, <laughs> scholarly uh, endeavor, Justice Rising, Robert Kennedy's America in Black and White. Um, Professor Sullivan, please join me and let's Let's dig into your fascinating and wonderful book. Great. Thank you so much, um, Randy. It's great to be with you long distance from your home state of South Carolina. Indeed. And uh, I want to thank Krishna and Matt and Abby and, of course, uh, Skip Gates um, for this opportunity and, uh, and Randall Kennedy so much for joining me to discuss and all of you out there, and I hope some of my former fellow fellows who I was with when I began this book. And it really means a lot to be uh, speaking here um, for a lot of reasons, but I was in the early stages of thinking about this book when I had a fellowship uh, at the Du Bois Research Institute in the spring of 2013. And um, I you know, had not uh, initially planned to write a book about Robert Kennedy, that was, probably the furthest thing from my mind. Um, like most historians of the civil rights movement, I kind of uh, thought of the Kennedys as sort of marginal to the story at best. Um, what I wanted to do, and, and Randy mentioned my book on the NAACP, um, my book on the NAACP really looks at how this organization creates an infrastructure for a national civil rights movement rooted throughout the country from its founding in 1909 up to the 1950s. So I wanted to take a fresh look at the 1960s. Um, and I aimed to get beyond the sort of civil rights, black power dichotomy and look at the decade as a time of racial reckoning that reached into all parts of the country. Um, and, you know, so after much reading and talking with friends and some friends have been in the movement, uh, I realized that Robert Kennedy was sort of my way in. Uh, his, his public life, and again, I found this through the reading about the movement, what's happening in cities during this period, that his public life was forged at the intersection of race, history, and politics. It really drove the dynamics of change in the 1960s. Um, so uh, that's how I came to this. It surprised me. And in researching and writing this book, it, it really fulfilled what I wanted to do which is take a fresh look and, uh, and, and open this decade up in, in some new ways. Um, I wanna read a, just a brief excerpt from the book, uh, which looks at Kennedy in the immediate months after the assassination of his brother and provides a sense of what he is thinking about and understands by that point in 1964. Um, so this will just be very short because we wanna get to our discussion. Uh, Robert Kennedy, resumed an active schedule of speaking and travel during the spring months of 1964. He was still attorney general. Uh, while he remained closely involved in strategizing on the civil rights bill, which by the way, he and his brother had done so much to shape and, and create the 
set a strategy for getting him passed. His attention turned to the challenges and opportunities ahead. His speeches reveal an evolving understanding of the racial crisis gripping the country with a strong focus on the interrelated um, issues of poverty and criminal justice. Young people continued to be central to his interest from those who bore the toll of segregation and discrimination to college students who were among the country's most privileged. He sought to raise their awareness of social ills and injustices and prod them to act. In, uh, in an address in Toronto in April of 64, Kennedy observed that young people in many parts of the world were in quote, a revolution against the status quo, turning their anger on the systems which have allowed poverty, illiteracy and oppression to flourish. Our future, he advised, is tied up with what they think. He spoke similarly about the revolution going on in the United States to an audience at the University of Chicago Law School, saying he sensed that there was an opening at this moment in history, a time of genuine concern about social justice. Time, he said, is an irreplaceable commodity. On April 16th, Kennedy participated in a panel discussion in Washington entitled After the Civil Rights Bill, What? The mere passage of legislation, he explained, will not make racial difficulties disappear. Quote, we are going to have to pay for what has gone on in the past. For Kennedy, one of the most important reasons to pass the bill was to, quote, reestablish confidence that the Negro people and the white people can work together to solve our problems. Failure would confirm a growing feeling among African Americans, particularly young people, that there is no future in this system. Legislation and federal action were essential, but not enough. There must be action by newspapers, local citizens, local political leaders, possibly starting with schools. Quote, we can talk about it, we can make all the patriotic speeches we want to, but all those speeches are made by white people. It was time to act. So I'll just end there. Let me ask you a question prompted by uh, a sentence in your preface. At the end of your preface, you say, my hope is that Justice Rising will challenge and upend some of the interpretations that have framed our understanding of the 1960s. What did you, what, what are the things that you want to upend? Um, I guess, a, 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 again, it's sort of what drove me to the book, a way we think about, it's almost a visual history where we think of the sit-ins and nonviolent protests and, and what happened in the South. And there seems to be kind of a sharp divide between that and how we end the decade um, with, you know, urban uprisings, the rise of law and order politics, white backlash. Um, and to see, you know, again, this convergence of race politics and for people who are active, particularly whites, <laughs> like the Kennedys, this sort of facing history, you know, they have these references that they make to the uh, Reconstruction era as a time of possibility that was lost, right? And and this sense that the 60s really were, I mean, people have called it the second reconstruction, but that doesn't quite get at it. It, it put on the table the issues we're still dealing with today. And, um, and, and I think there's a tendency to minimize, maybe minimize the changes because what it took to get, you know, to, to get the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, but also to understand that the Civil Rights Movement really expose the deep history in this country and the consequences of at least since, since Reconstruction, 100 years of not you know, following through on the Reconstruction Amendments, on the promise of emancipation. So it's kind of make the history more relevant, but not in, in a reductive way, but kind of an open-ended way, if that makes sense. You know, when, so in terms of upending things, one of the things that it seemed to me that your book upends is um, a particular view of the Kennedys, including Robert Kennedy. I mean, mm -hmm. particularly amongst in 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 progressive civil rights historiography, mm -hmm. uh, the Kennedys don't come off so well, as you indicated yeah. in your early remarks. And you give a very uh, full-throated, I'd say, you know, defense of the Kennedys, including um, Robert Kennedy. Am I am, am I correct in 
Well, is, I don't know if that, I quoted that part the of, Was that part of what you were attempting to accomplish? Well, you know, like I said, I didn't start out to write a book about the Kennedys. My book is about the movement, really. And they're in it, you know. And, and I think what's interesting, well, more than interesting, a revelation to me is that they were oriented towards the demand. You know, and, and I went to the archives. And that's, <laughs> there's an interview with Thurgood Marshall, which I found sort of halfway into my work, mm -hmm. uh, that it is really astounding that John Kennedy, when he was a candidate, invited Marshall, asked him to come to have lunch with him in the Senate in April of 1960. And Marshall said, I went for lunch. I was there all day. And, and I recommend this interview, but he said he got it. He had all the statistics on voting. He understood about the, the challenge with school desegregation. He understood the country and, and, and really what it's going to take. And Marshall said, I have confidence that he is going to move, you know, that he will when he... And, and to me, I mean, to hear, and Marshall was interviewed in 1964. So it wasn't like many decades later. It was like, you know, four years later. Um, so that's sort of a signal. Um, when JFK appointed Bobby to be, or asked, told his brother, he wanted him to be attorney general. Um, there was a meeting that John Siegenthaler was at. And again, this is December of 1960. And he says to his brother, the civil rights is gonna be the main issue. I need someone I can trust, someone who's going to make the tough choices. And he said to him, we're going to have to change the climate in this country. Now, there's two different, you know, you know change the, I mean, I'm, so they, they come into, the, into office with a sense of, you know, what the challenges are. But then there's the, the piece about how you, how you function in the political framework of 1961, 62, with a Congress dominated by Southern Democrats, but the Justice Department, and again, research, this was a revelation to me. Robert Kennedy's Justice Department was remarkable. And I talked to Bob Moses about this. And Bob became very close with John Burr and Marshall. And they had disagreements in 63 after Greenwood. I mean, that was it, you know. But the effort to put this field operation of lawyers in the South, who ended up sort of aligning with the Moses and people working in Mississippi and other parts as they were investigating and getting testimony is really important. And I think what we historians have done, I was guilty of this. We listened to what movement people thought about the Kennedys, the impatience, which totally, and then we kind of take that as our opinion instead of trying to understand the context that, you know, that their opinions are more than valid. I mean, of course they're impatient. Of course they wanted the federal government to do more. But if you look at the other side of the coin, it's what are the challenges there? What are the constraints? What are the limitations? And I think that's really, I've noticed as I've, you know, done this book and look at some of the secondary sources that, you know, people quote James Baldwin's opinion of John Kennedy in 1963 as, you know, gospel. Well, in 1970, he was saying something totally different because he had perspective. And so I think that's been really an explanation for why there hasn't been a deeper engagement of, um, of the history around them. Because my thing isn't to sort of elevate them, it's like the movement pushed them. And how I think about their response, they responded both to the demands and the opportunities. I mean, they saw what, where this country had to go and, and how deep the problem was, you know, generations were. And so that was what was really interesting about it. And again, as, you map, as I mapped it out, you just see, you know, Robert Kennedy's response to black power, suppose God is black, part of the Life magazine. You know, so it, it's once you start, I mean, it's a, you ask a different question, you find out some things. And, and that's, um, so, so uh, yeah, it was a big surprise to me. I'd like to take you back. You've been, we've been talking about the 1960s. I'd like to take you back to, uh, an event in 1950. You mentioned Robert Kennedy. Robert Kennedy is a law student at the University of Virginia. Mm -hmm. And you talk about a controversy at the University of Virginia Law School because Robert Kennedy invited, wanted to invite Ralph Bunch to give a talk. I think this is important because I think that people forget uh, you know, what it was like in the middle of the 20th century. So 
take over what happened in 1950 at the University of Virginia Law School when Robert Kennedy invited Ralph Bunch to speak. That's a, yeah, it's a great story. Yeah, he, uh, Ralph Bunch had just won the Nobel Peace Prize and Robert Kennedy was head of this student legal forum who hosted visiting speakers who would give a public address and then meet with the law students. And, um, you know, I think the reason he invited him because he'd been to the Middle East, Robert Kennedy had, and he was very concerned about what was going on in the Middle East. So when Ralph Bunch won the Nobel Peace, he invites him to UVA to be part of their forum. And Ralph Bunch responded, he'd be glad to come, but he would only if the meeting was not segregated, right? And that was the law in Virginia, segregation in public places. So he tried to rally his fellow students and they didn't want to, you know, so he talked to his law professors and, um, and they said, well, we can, we can set it up in Capitol Hall and just not put the sign up and people can sit with it. He said, no, no, put the sign up, but not enforce it. He said, no, it has to be. So a friend of mine who worked at the UVA Special Collection, I wouldn't have known this. He said, there's a letter to Colgate Darden, the president of the university from Robert Kennedy, as telling the president, this is what they'd like to do and why they should do it. He's citing the sweat case and the Warren case. And uh, so he, 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 and he says to, he says to Darden, these public meetings, there may be 100, 150 people usually attend. So he's trying to say, it's not gonna be a big deal, but he, this, we really have to have Ralph Bunch and on his term and it shouldn't be safe. So Darden agreed to make an exception. 1,500 people came, 1,500 people. And uh, Ralph Bunch stayed with Ethel and Bobby because you know, the, the uh, accommodations for African-Americans were, were not, there weren't in, in Charlottesville. I mean, terrible you know, places to stay. And uh, they became friends and then they maintained a friendship till the end of Robert Kennedy's life. But, but to me, in a way it's like, you know, like he said, wait a minute, I wanna do this, I should be able to do it. But I, I think, you know, there was pushback from his fellow students and he went ahead and got it done. And, and he said in an interview with Tony Lewis, he didn't say, oh, look what I did. He mentioned it as an aside, you know, it, it wasn't an epiphany. He didn't go off and become a civil rights crusader, but it showed that he recognized something and acted and, and that was a clue, you know, of, of his um, openness and his uh, willingness to act on this situation. So, yeah, that's... I wanna to go to an episode 13 years later. And indeed it's the episode with which you begin the book. It's an interesting way that you began the book because mm -hmm. you begin the book with Robert Kennedy in a meeting, very contentious meeting, with James Baldwin. And frankly, there are a number of people who've written about Robert Kennedy and portray this meeting as a meeting that suggests bad things about Robert Kennedy. You depict the meeting and you suggest that this meeting shows some very promising things about Robert Kennedy, promising things that actually blossomed in subsequent years. So again, take it from there. What happened in 1963 with Robert Kennedy and James Baldwin in New York City? You know, that's one of the stories that interested me in him. I mean, just the fact that he went and met with people, you know, I mean, here's the attorney general and he's you know, uh, sure, he'd read Baldwin's essay in the New Yorker and he, you know, and they had met at the White House and he thought, he thought that was a, a he's, he understood, he saw the problems in urban areas. Um, so he goes to this meeting and uh, he, uh, they, he and Burke Marshall have come from a very testy meeting with some department store owners that are trying to get them to start to desegregate their places. And, um, and it's, you know, it's Baldwin invites the, the people. It was a last minute thing. I mean, they set it up because they met in Washington. They didn't have enough time. So they're both going to be in New York and they set up this meeting. And he invites, you know, Lorraine Hansberry, Lena Horne, Harry Belafonte, uh, Clarence Jones. You know, a really an interesting group of people, Kenneth Clark, uh, about 10 people or so. And um, Baldwin's brother, David, brings along Jerome Smith, who was, uh, had been, involved in the freedom rides and the sit-ins like for the last 
for years and, and had been beaten up. And he was, he was like a soldier coming from the front lines of the battle. He was in New York for treatment of a broken jaw. So he, he's the one that really gets things going because um, you know Kennedy comes in and of course, this is May of 1963. Birmingham has exploded. They're dealing, getting ready to desegregate the University of Alabama. They're dealing with George Wallace. Um, they're after Birmingham, there's, you know, all over the country, there are protests and, and demonstrations. And so it's a very tense period, lots of pressure. And they're beginning, they've written the Civil Rights Act and it, it worked. So all that's going on. And so Kennedy is really looking to this group to think about what can we do to try to calm things down <laughs> so we can get this, you know, I mean, things are really tense. And, and he begins by, I think, you know, there's no transcript, but a lot of people have talked about this meeting and, and all the rest. So I pieced it together from lots of oral histories and accounts. And he, he begins by uh, trying to talk about what they're doing with the Civil Rights Act and trying to get that done and you know, looking to them for some kind of you know, understanding and support. And Jerome Smith you know, looks at this guy, he's the federal government, and he says, being in a room with you makes me want to vomit. And he's shocked and he looked to the others and, and they, kind of aligned with him and, and the lid comes off. That's why, I mean, the, the anger, the frustration, the they just unload on him and just start talking about the FBI and the, all the things the federal government has done to, to the, you know, a lot, support, I mean, create segregation and the failure of the Kennedy administration to act faster to, to deal with it. And it's, uh, and he tries to respond and, it just does not, doesn't work. So he, he goes on for three hours and he just sits there. Uh, and his responses are kind of a little off point. <laughs> they make people more angry, right? And then Harry Belafonte says, well, I'm friends with them. No, they ignore Harry. You know, just let's, you know, just, it's, it's just remarkable. And everyone who was at that meeting, who remember, so it was just, Kenneth Clark said, it's the most violent verbal assault I ever witnessed, right? And um, Kennedy was, angry when he left the meeting, they were angry. I mean, it, it was just, and to me, it just captured, you know, he wanted to talk policy. You couldn't talk policy. This was beyond policy, right? I mean, it just, and, and the whole issue, I mean, the, the, the communication difficulty, the tense nature of the meeting. Um, I, I mean, when you read about it and think about it, it, it just, uh, it was just extraordinary encounter. And uh, and he just felt they didn't want to listen to that, how you pass the law, and they thought he didn't care. And, didn't do it. and it's, um, so people say it changed him. But by the time he went into that meeting, he knew how awful things were in the cities. Like I said, he read balls and he thought, you know, the fire next time, that was captured a reality that he, he understood. Um, so, you know, it, it um, and what Kenneth Clark said after that meeting, he said the fact that he sat there for three hours and listened mm -hmm. means he is the best a white America has to offer. And that might not be saying much about white America. But so my, my thing about the people, so about a month later, the story gets out, you know, Baldwin talks to the press and they thought he thought and he, that kind of bothered and it gets out and there's a lot of talk about it. And he meets with these journalists and they say, so what about that? Are you going to meet with black groups again? He said, yes, of course. He said, they're not the problem. It's the white people <laughs> who are denying Negroes their rights. So, you know, it was an unpleasant experience for him, but it um, was one that I think, you know, it, it didn't, you know, it, it didn't deter him from and, and the sad thing is that Baldwin reflects later. I mean, you know, they didn't, their past didn't cross again except the King's funeral. But um, I mean, I can read it later, but Baldwin looked back on that meeting in 1970 and looked back on Robert Kennedy's life and, um, and saw it in a way that many of the people who've written about that meeting haven't really uh, engaged with, you know. I, I just think it just captured the, the racial tensions and the divide, the very real divide that separated the experiences of the people in the room, especially Jerome Smith. And, and of course, everyone just rallied around him and, and Kennedy, who, you know, was faced a different kind of situation. But, um, you know, I think it just it showed the, the depth of the, of the problem and, 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 the, and the divide. 
even okay. even between you know someone who is really well meaning and and trying to work towards for the change. Does that make sense to you? Sure, it does. But let me. I I, I want to press you a bit more. Yeah. With respect to Robert Kennedy. Robert Kennedy was Attorney General of the United States, which made him nominally the boss of the Department of Justice. He okay. therefore was the superior, the boss to J. Edgar Hoover. Mm -hmm. Yet Attorney General Robert Kennedy okayed the wiretapping of Martin Luther King Jr. Telephones. In October, and, uh, and, yeah, yeah. And, and, and not just once, but on several occasions. Mm -hmm. Now, this was one of the most terrible encroachments mm -hmm. on civil liberties in the era. Mm -hmm. It was part of, you know, a terrible campaign mm -hmm. to undermine uh, the Black Liberation Movement. Mm -hmm. Robert mm -hmm. Kennedy was involved. What say you? Well, yes. I mean, there's no question about that. And I, I think, you know, how much time do we have? Uh, and there's, there's, no, there's no excuse, let's just say that. In trying to understand that myself, um, and, and you may have more information than I, but the taps went on in October of 63 of King's phone. They attacked Levinson and others of King's phone. And um, Hoover, uh, after the, anyway, so that, that's, you know, when he was put, and he hesitated, but he finally did do it. He agreed to tap his office phone, and uh, he put a 30 day, uh, where they revisit in 30 days. And I've talked with, I've read David Garrow, I've read some others, and I've talked with people who knew Kennedy. And they, they give a couple of explanations because, you know, when the Civil Rights Bill was up, both George Wallace and uh, Governor of Mississippi, uh, Ross Barnett, said King's a communist. Isn't Kennedy wrote letters to senators saying King is not a communist. I mean, the Kennedys knew that there was no problem, you know, that that was, they knew that for what it was. On the other hand, you mentioned Hoover and the power Hoover had. Um, two things. People think the blackmail around John Kennedy and his personal life. He had, he had contacted the Attorney General shortly prior to this October wiretapping with infamous, information about Judith Campbell. And the other thing uh, that people speculate is the Civil Rights Act, that Hoover could leak stuff to the press. I mean, you know, Hoover had a lot of power. And, um, and so, you know, again, no excuse, but if you try to understand why he did it, uh, and, you know, I mean, Hoover had a tremendous amount of power, um, and I think he just felt, let him tap the phones, he's not going to find anything. And this is different, and people from bugging, you know, bugs in hotel rooms, which Lyndon Johnson knew about and did nothing to stop. This is tapping the phones, and again, a total violation of civil liberties, if you say, Randy. So, no, I'm not here to defend every action that Robert Kennedy ever made. But to me, it does not take away from how he moves through his life and through this period. Um, but that is, yeah, one of the, the real negatives. Um, but again, to try to understand that, I think it's, it's worthwhile. Let's talk about Senator Kennedy. So he's, he's, he's Attorney General, then suffers, of course, a terrible blow. The, death of his brother, the, the president. Uh, and then he, he, he becomes a senator. Um, tell us about Senator Kennedy and particularly his um, crusade on behalf of the marginalized. Obviously, as attorney general, he had been, you know, like you've already said, front and center in the uh, you know the, the 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 white black conflict, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but as senator, he really the he, he he becomes involved in a larger struggle. Mm -hmm. uh, Chicanos, 
Native Americans, the mm -hmm. poor. And he, and he, I mean, it's this, this sort of, he, he, well, he, yeah. tell us about it. No, well, you know, the, he, when he was attorney general, you know, he, uh, but he traveled a lot. He was somebody, as Marion Wright Edelman said, he went, he saw, he listened, he grew. And he, he was very aware of the, of the poverty in urban areas and, and, and the racial nature of that, but not just, but, but certainly the racial nature of, of urban segregation, discrimination, and all the horrible consequences of that. And um, his brother was moving towards sort of a more on poverty kind of approach. I mean, that poverty had become an issue um, for them uh, as well as, as race. And so when he goes to the Senate, He's a big supporter of Johnson's uh, war on poverty, testifies for that. And again, he's going out around the country and just seeing uh, conditions. And, um, you know, as attorney general, he started to pay attention to, the, to Native Americans. Uh, and as a senator, he goes visits reservations and sees the problems. Um, he goes to uh, Appalachia, to Kentucky, and he's on committees. I forget the name of the committee that um, Joseph Clark chaired, the senator from Pennsylvania, but they did hearings to, to evaluate the, the, the war on poverty programs. And through that, they'd go out into the field and he was just exposed to uh, a depth of poverty that shocked him. Uh, the way he got out to California is that he was involved with labor. The UAW was representing the United, what would be the United Farm Workers and they were holding hero, uh, hearings uh, out there. And so he agreed to go and he met Cesar Chavez and he saw you know, what was happening out there in those fields and, and, and to migrant workers and the attacks on the unions and unionizing bribes. So he sees the interconnection and he saw that in the cities between race and poverty. And, um, and I wanna show a, a screen share that um, Marion Wright testified before Clark's committee about the poverty in Mississippi. And uh, he, they said, we wanna go have hearings there. So I thought this was really, let me get my number of my, uh, let's see, screen share. Okay, can, there, can you see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, let's see if we can get to the, to the one I want. Well, there's, they're here. Here he is. Well, there. He, with Fannie Lou Hamer and Anita Blackwell, listening to them talk about how the Head Start program is being squeezed. Um, and from that, he goes into the field with Marion and uh, Amzie Moore, who was, had been Bob Moses' contact. But these are just some of the pictures of him just going and seeing. Um, and again, he, he goes back to Washington and he goes immediately to the Secretary of Agriculture and says, you've got to get some food down there. You know, and, and you know, so proactive that way, and then hearings about the health conditions and the rest. Um, so it's such a, you know, this thing of going out, seeing, listening, and then coming back and using his role as a senator with people like Joseph Clark and Abraham River to put a national spotlight on these conditions and really to show the limitations of Johnson's war on poverty because um, that's Bedford Stuyvesant, where Bed Stuy, where he, as a senator, uh, works of the community to develop a restoration project that was quite extraordinary. Um, so I think that, uh, and the River Cough hearings, which I wanna mention, uh, which was a major source for me, not just for what he's doing, but for what is being exposed before the current commission report. Uh, they had six weeks of hearings on the crisis in, in urban America, and not just racial crisis, but poverty, but race was a big part of it. And, um, the testimony, 70 people testified, again, which really showed the limits of the war on poverty and, and the need for more resources and a more targeted approach. And um, King was the last person to testify and he and Kennedy had this kind of soliloquy you know, of, of what's happening and why, this is 66, so we've already had Watts and, and uh, other places. And that's when King makes his famous statement that riots of the language of the unheard. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I, I think that that, and, and one of the very interesting things in, in researching this book is the alignment of King and Kennedy by this time period in terms of their concerns around the cities, around poverty, and around the
the war. You know, your, your pictures of Senator Kennedy visiting various places really resonates with me. I, I met Senator Kennedy one time. I met him in 1968. It was the Sunday after the rioting in Washington, D.C. Um, my family got word that uh, he was going, that uh, Senator Kennedy was going to go to a church in uh, downtown D.C. Mm -hmm. And we went, just a little church, little, little, little church. And we went and filing out, um, I shook hands with him. Of course, within, well, that was April. Within two months, of course, he was dead. That's the, that that's was... the one, that was the one time, but I, I think it was, it was mean, it, you know, it, it fits in with your, you know, the, the traveling, the going. Again, Washington, D.C., that particular Sunday, I mean, you could still smell the burn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, he didn't, he, did, he didn't, he, he just, he just was there. It was Reverend Fauntroy's church. That's where right. it was. It was right. Reverend Fauntroy's been... church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he just shook hands with people quietly. It's a very somber, as you can imagine, just shook hands with people leaving. Go there's ahead. A picture, there's a picture in the book, which I don't have on the PowerPoint, of him walking through by 14th Street and just and, and to a scene that looks like, you know, after a war. I mean, it's but that's I didn't know that, Randy. That's um amazing. Okay. Let me ask you a question about methodology. Mm -hmm. So with something you know with how do you deal with the problem of uh retrospective testimony so here's a man who you know he knew lots of people people who he knew who he touched uh you know enemies and allies mm -hmm. are alive you interview them but um, they have a whole, they have decades that, mm -hmm. you know, have transpired. And then furthermore, you're dealing with a person who was murdered. So we have the martyrdom problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with which testimony you're going to credit? You know, because people can, you know, people... Again, people are trying to be honest and everything, but of course, our memories are affected by, you know, the, the, just the, the passage of time. How do you deal with that? Well, Frank, in terms of the research for the book, I mean, I, I, I have been interested in, in hearing from people who knew him and, or, you know, remember him. But in terms of my research for the book, the people I interviewed were people like you know, Frank Mankiewicz's press secretary with specific questions about things, uh, John Siegenthaler, Peter Edelman, mm -hmm. um, but again, sort of, and really mapping what they remember against what I can research and find out. And, um, you know, someone like Bob Moses, who never knew Robert Kennedy directly, but but interacted with his Justice Department. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Bob got me into John Doerr's papers. And to me, you know, one thing Bob told me that really struck me is that when they were getting ready to take the MFDP to Atlantic City, he said, I asked Burke Marshall, can Bobby help us? Just the fact that he asked Burke Marshall <laughs> if Bobby could help them get, you know, get somewhere at Atlantic City. And what Marshall said, and then I found some, you know, King sent a telegram that Marshall said he's flat out with his brother, you know, thing, he gave it, and that he has no power with Johnson. He's not a delegate. Um, so that, you know, he, it really was nothing he could do. And, and if people are familiar with that convention, he gave that speech about his brother. And, uh, but that, that Bob felt that way really struck me. Um, so I think the oral histories I were, was able to do. Now, John Lewis, his book was more helpful to me. I mean, John was very romantic about Bobby Kennedy. I love Bobby Kennedy and, and he did. And, but, you know, his book um, was very helpful to me as well as meeting him and hearing his story. Um, but yeah, and then Margaret Marshall, you know, who took him through South Africa. 
that was more a recording of what that was like, you know, the scene. And so, you, you know, you, you know, it wasn't, oh, he's great or this, but what they did, where they went, how people reacted. So, um, so those, you know, I, I felt were um, very useful. And, but I had the filter on it you described. And, and I really didn't interview people who were, you know, kind of, because people like Frank Mank, I mean, you know, they've sort of, you know, they just remember the, where they were, you know, flying from Muncie to Indianapolis when they heard King was killed, hit, shot, and then they landed and they found that he was dead. I mean, that memory and that experience, I think, had, had resonance across the years. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I didn't have too much problem, I think. With the... You know, it, it is interesting that um, you, you've talked throughout about how uh, movement activists who said one thing about the Kennedys changed. Oh, no. No, they didn't, I mean, well. Some may have. I don't think, I, I never read anything Bob said negative about, you know, personally about the, he was too busy, you know, I mean, so no, I think some, Gloria Richardson was someone who really liked Bobby Kennedy. I found that out through Martha Noonan. And of course he brought Gloria to the Justice Department when Cambridge was exploding, read her reports on poverty. So I think specific cases, you know, people are, you know, it's really individuals and what their relationship is and how they remember. But I didn't, you know, I, I didn't talk to, uh, I mean, and the people I talked with like Martha Noonan and, uh, uh, Bob and John Lewis, and I never got to, to interview Lori Richardson, Richardson directly, but she has written about this. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, I'm not sure whether, you know, movement activists one way or the other have changed their minds about Kennedy, but I think if you're, if you're remembering from your particular experience then, you know, and you're not, so, there wouldn't be a reason to really change. But I think someone like, uh, you know, yeah, so, I, so I'm not sure what the question was, but I, I don't wanna make it appear that, you know, I, I've surveyed movement people and they've all changed their mind. My point is that historians weren't in the movement and our job is to, that whatever people felt about them are totally entitled to. I mean, they've got their lives on the line and, you know, and it's interesting, it's important how they feel. But as scholars, we need to put that in a context and really try to understand, you know, the, the, the larger context. Okay. And that's why I've got my Baldwin thing I'll read at the end, because I think that's a perfect example of someone reflecting and, um, and having lived through the rest of the 60s, beyond 63, and through the assassinations, uh, to the election of Richard Nixon, you know, some kind of perspective on, um, on, on that moment. And uh, yeah, so. What about yourself? What do you do you think do you think it has made a difference or that you know just you're writing this in this book, wonderful book, wonderfully detailed book in the second decade of the 21st century after a long, you know, in in the in the middle of reaction um has that reaction against among other things movements toward racial justice do you think that that has affected i don't know your framing your assessment i mean it was one thing for instance in you know i i, I clearly remember people you know stand-up comedians who would go on forever uh, cussing out and, you know, making fun of, you know, sort of the hapless white liberal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the white liberal was, you know, lashed and laughed at <laughs> and, you know, kicked around. Well, I mean, you know, that's, you know, so maybe in a certain setting, one can make light of, you know, the liberal. Uh, in the age of Trump, does that affect how one views, uh, you know, liberalism? Does that affect how one views uh, the, the the limits, the possibilities of uh, movements for social change? 
Well, I don't know, if, you know, um, there's a book that says, you know, the last liberal is whatever. I don't know if I call, you know, liberal is a big umbrella. Mm -hmm. I think he was quite exceptional as a white political figure in this period. There was a, a, a guy in Watts, he's my last chapter is called, the second to last, the last of the great believables, right? The last of the great, that's what he called Robert Kennedy. And I think to me, the, what resonates today is that he was facing issues. He, he described the crisis of the country not really facing the, the root causes of these rebellions and uprisings and the horrible conditions and you know, answering the police um, that we, we, what happened was law and order approach prevailed, policing increased, militarized, incarceration grew, everything that he and King and others were really looking at this as a moment of reckoning. Um, so I think it does frame our present in sort of these unresolved issues. But I think if, yeah, to do a broad brush of anybody, is not useful because we're in deep trouble, just like we were then <laughs> in the late 60s. And we need to listen to each other. And, and you know, there's the white liberal. I mean, I think there are a lot of white liberals who are pretty, uh, you know, kind of on the margins. And, and King talked to them. He did a great editorial in January of 66. And first about, you know, don't be patting yourself on the back. There's work to do. And Robert Kennedy knew there was work to do. And he didn't. You know, position himself as being the friend of, he cared about the future of the country and he saw, um, you know, he saw where the problems were. And, um, and I think that we, we live in the aftermath of, of the unresolved issues uh, that were put on the table by the civil rights movement and the black freedom movement in the late sixties and people who really tried to grapple with them and force the country. Instead, we get, the war in Vietnam, a war in poverty that was barely a skirmish, in the words of Dr. King, and uh, and that, but I think is terribly relevant to today because we we're struggling with the same issues. And you know, and he had a great saying. He'd say, "We didn't create the world; we inherited." So you know, people, but here we are, and we are the trustees for the future. And and so, and how important history is for kind of orienting yourself in where we are and and what to do. Um, so that's a long answer, <laughs> but I don't, know, I don't know what to call, but a liberal kind of, you know, that's, but I hear what you're saying, you know, progressive people, people who are concerned. And I think we have to listen to each other, encourage each other and challenge each other um, as we go ahead, just like they did then. I've got many more questions, but I would <laughs> certainly encourage folks who are in the audience who are watching uh, send in your questions. I'll be happy to to voice them. So, I think, yeah. go ahead. No, uh, this, is, this has been very engrossing, but I think the audience members might have some questions. Um, Brian Mahan, I think, has indicated. Ah, uh, yes. I, I I thought I was. I guess I was looking in the chat. Am I looking in the wrong place? Um, I think there are several boxes being used. <laughs> Hey, Kimmy, I don't see myself coming on. I... We see ah, you. please, go ahead. Oh, am I on? Yeah, please. <laughs> oh, great, yeah. I had a question uh, from, from the kind of, I don't know what you'd call it now, the radical left, the white part of the movement, Tom Hayden and the Weathermen and all that. Tom Hayden became very close friends with Robert Kennedy, both Irish Catholic in background. Hayden thought, John never became anything close to radicalized, but Robert did in part by reappropriating his own Irish history of oppression. Um, <clears throat> their friendship was based on that. And Hayden, of course, was doing something similar, became involved in Northern Ireland. Uh, anything to say about the radical left of Hayden and, and Robert Kennedy? Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't know a lot about their relationship, but I think that the radical left, I think, you know, he gave a really interesting speech at Berkeley in 1966, where he talked about, we need dissent, we need, you know, you know, I think he embraced, you know, the left. I mean, people on the left who were pushing, pushing against the war, pushing uh, against poverty. I mean, what Hayden didn't know, Robert Kennedy would have loved that. 
Um, I think as far as his background goes and in terms of his Irishness, that's an interesting question. I, I really tried to sort out, you know, what it is that made him who he was and, and became and the way he sort of moved through his life. And um, I mean, that, that could be part of it, but I think it, it's a number of things. Um, but, I, but yes, he didn't, you know, he, he was open to people working at the radical edge. I mean, I, I think of Kennedy think, looking for radical solutions to uh, the challenges and problems that he saw during this period. Um, but I think that's a really good question, which I'm gonna think more about, about that relationship. Did Catholicism have any bearing on I think his did. action and thinking in this realm? You know, he was friends with Dan Berrigan. I mean, I think he was, you know, a radical social justice. I, I really, I've, I've tried to kind of suss that out. Um, he was a practicing Catholic. He went to mass every Sunday. He did not hesitate to criticize priests. He was kind of anti-clerical. So, um, you know, I think his, 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 his faith tradition and how he embraced it was certainly probably part of his orientation to these issues and, um, and to the responsibility to, um, to do something, yeah. Floor is open. Others. I think people are being hesitant. Do you have more questions, Professor Kennedy? Oh, I certainly do. I mean, this is a this is a this is a book that generates. This is a book that generates, um, you know, many questions like, like you know, fine books, like fine books do. Oh, let me throw you a Please question. go ahead that answers your other question. This is something you said at Berkeley, but this speaks to today. He said, um, we live, like it or not, like it or not, we live in a time of danger and uncertainty. There is but one choice, to face our difficulties and strive to overcome them or turn away, bring increasing repression, human pain and civil strife. So I, I mean, that echoes to today, you know, I mean, it just seems overwhelming. And um, it is a time of danger and uncertainty. And just, so I thought that was, um, again, I think a lot resonates from, from this period, later period and, and today. Hillary Worthen. Hi, thank you. Uh, wonderful discussion. Uh, I uh, was struck when I did some work in South Africa in about 2000 about the impact of Robert Kennedy's visit there in, in 1966. I encountered a number of physicians who were profoundly inspired by his, uh, what he did. He met with uh, uh, Chief Luthuli and, and others uh, uh, and pretty much violated the strictures that the nationalist government tried to put on him. Uh, and then I was, uh, it was remarkable to hear Margaret Marshall, the Chief Justice of the Massachusetts uh, Supreme Judicial Court, uh, describe the impact that that speech had on her as a young woman sitting in the audience in the National uh, Union of South African Students uh, as he gave his famous Ripples of Hope speech. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I wonder if you had uh, more information about that and, and how that came about. Um, thank you. It's really fascinating to hear that, that your ex bit about your experience there and his, um, his impact. Uh, he was invited by the students, by the, the student group that she was a part of, uh, anti-apartheid group. And King was invited at the same time. And they, they denied King a visa, but they thought with Kennedy, they, they probably shouldn't do that since he might be president someday. I mean, I think that was sort of the reasoning. They did not want him to come. So they wouldn't let any American press travel with him. And uh, so he went. And uh, as she told me, she described the scene at the airport when he arrived, that, you know, everybody was there <laughs> across all races. And, you know, and, and he walked into the colored side of the airport and gave his welcoming comments. And as you point out, he just traveled through South Africa. And uh, there's a great film about, about his trip. Um, and went everywhere, no government officials would meet with him. But he met with students, he uh, would give, you know, speeches just in the middle of the street. And the longer he was there, the more kinds of people would turn out. And this was younger people, and, but 
all kinds, Africanus would turn out. I mean, he had audiences all through the country and he was there for five days. And um, when he went to see Chief Latuli, uh, I mean, that was huge. You know, he was in, so, what do they call that? Not solitary confinement, he was banned. Uh, and, and Kennedy went to see him and uh, had found impact on, on Robert Kennedy meeting this man who had been head of the ANC. And, um, and then he went to Soweto and as his filmmaker told me, nobody, nobody went there in daytime. I mean, you know, they go at night and they, he just went and, uh, you know, there's wonderful pictures. I have in my book, I, I found a photographer and just give impromptu talks, you know, throughout, um, throughout the township there. So uh, as he was leaving, they said they wanted him to come back again. And the government said, absolutely not. You know, he can never come back. Um, but it, it was, writing about that trip was, was really, um, and again, he's learning and, and he's giving them, he, he sees that their challenges are even greater than, you know, in, in our country, even though he compares the two of them. His opening speech is comparing a country and people think he's talking about South Africa. He's, I'm talking about my country. You know, so he saw the real, the real parallels, um, but also the, you know, the uh, inspiring the people who were struggling to carry on. And when he left, I mean, I researched newspaper accounts and the rest that people, it, it really gave, he was the first person of national stature who was against apartheid to come into the country and be able to, to move around and talk with people. And it was, as you described, it, it really uh, resonated and, um, at that really dark time. Professor Sullivan, before we close up, uh, there are a number of members of the audience who want you to speak about uh, Baldwin and Robert Kennedy. Uh, you, you mentioned that earlier, and I think there's some people that are on the edge of their seats. They want oh, to hear great. what you to say about that. Well, I'm so glad because I found this interview I went to the JFK library right before it closed down because of the pandemic. And I was right at the end of my book. And it, and, and it was like, yeah. so here's what he said. This is an excerpt from the interview. And it's an interview that Gene Stein did with him. They had interviewed a lot of people who'd been on the train, but also other people who knew Kennedy or interacted with him. And, and this is him talking to her. I think things might've been very different in this country if we had not had so many assassinations. This is in 1970, he's talking to her. He regretted that he had not spoken with Bobby again after that May 1963 meeting. He told her that they had seen each other one more time across a distance at Martin Luther King's funeral. But now that Kennedy was gone, he reflected on what had been lost. Quote, he was somebody in the 20th century with enough passion, and energy and patience, Baldwin said. Speaking of Bobby and his brother, Baldwin comment, commented, quote, they both had minds that could be reached. Bobby may have been exasperated with those people at the infamous 1963 meeting, being hit against the wall, this is Baldwin's words, and described as naive, but at least there's some contact, some connection, there's dialogue, there's something, that's something that makes things possible. He concluded, quote, you know, black people had a very different feeling toward government when Bobby and JFK were alive than we've had since. I can't repeat it too often. That is one of the most sinister facts of present day American life. That atmosphere no longer exists. So. Professor Sullivan, thanks so much. And I'd like to also thank, of course, the Hutchins Center for providing to all of us this, this forum. Um, are there officials with the Hutchins Center who want to who, who want to who want to put an end to the to the session? Sure. Um, thank you very much, both of you, for this fascinating discussion. And everyone should go and get the book. Yes, Harvard <laughs> Bookstore has lots of copies. Indeed. <laughs> Thank you very thank you much, everybody, for coming for your questions. And Randy, thanks so much. And let's talk. <laughs> thank you, Krishna. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.